cool teachers. They've been teaching us math and English and science. But I think dad was getting a bit bored. He introduced a new subject. It was called Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. He said it would tell us some really wise things. So we wanted to share some of our best lessons with you. Chocolate is vital to our survival. Dinosaurs didn't have chocolate and look what happened to them. Before you criticize someone, you should walk a mile in their shoes. That way, when you do criticize them, you'll be a mile away and you'll have their shoes. If you see someone wearing camouflage, you should walk right into them. That way, they know it's working. <laughs> this one's dedicated to Shannon, who thought that it was the best of the bunch. When I try on an outfit and it doesn't make me look good, I just throw it on the floor. It's like saying, oh no, you don't deserve to be hung up. You're going to sit there and think about what you've done. Dad, I don't think those thoughts are as deep as you think they are. You might need to go learn something more. But I know someone who's got some good thoughts to share. Carl! Here's this week's episode of Grow TV. Hey, old chicken nuggets. It's me, Carl. Welcome to Grow TV. Welcome to Grow TV. Hosted by Carl. Where we have fun with our friends, talk about Jesus, and go over everything the Bible has to offer. Now once again, welcome to Grow TV! Hi there kiddos, it's so good to see y'all today. I've had an awesome week. Earlier this week, I went to my Maymaw's house to see all the things she had in her basement. Oh, don't worry, she told me I couldn't. She said there was a lot of things in there that she would pass down to me one day. As soon as I walked in, I found a dollar on the ground. Turns out it was just a piece of chocolate, though, which was awesome. Then I found a list of New Year's resolutions I made a year ago. New Year's resolutions are things that you want to get better at or complete by the end of the next year. I used to write them and send them to my Mayma ever since I was a kid. Turns out she kept them all in one box. And <laughs> oh man, did I make some great resolutions. Mind if I read them out loud? I'll read them anyway. I put them all on the interweb. <laughs> Number one, gain five pounds. You see, a lot of people want to lose weight, but I figure I should gain some weight. Couple of cheeseburgers and bam, <laughs> I was there. Easiest resolution ever. Number two, quit spending so much money. I did great with this goal. Knocked it out of the park. Sure, maybe because I had no money, but hey, <laughs> I did it. New Year's resolution number three, only believe in what you see. Now this is a good one. You see, I heard that phrase a long time ago from someone very old and very wise. Only believe what you can see. But I feel like I haven't done a good job of that. So let's try. But first I gotta think of things that we believe in that we can't see. All right, gravity. What is gravity? It's what makes everything fall? All right, why well, I refuse to believe in gravity. All right, electricity. All right, I'm gonna look straight up into the lights to prove I don't believe in electricity. Yeah, that's not a good idea. All right, last one, air. Now people say air is super important, but <laughs> you can't even see it. So you heard it here first. I, Carl, do not believe in air. <gasps> oh. Carl, what's going on, man? Look, man, it's been a long time, man. How you been doing? Yeah, good, Carl, Carl, I, I, I said, how are you? How are you doing? Carl? Carl, blink twice if you need help, bro. Blink. Carl, breathe, man. Breathe. <sighs> bro, what in the world are you doing? What is what is going on? 
I don't believe in air. What do you mean you don't believe in air? Well, I've made the decision. I'm not believing in anything I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> oh man dj why are you laughing i'm sorry bro that's just the funniest thing i've heard in a long time <laughs> you don't believe in air uh, uh, i don't believe <laughs> you, you're crazy carl you're crazy man <laughs> what's so funny carl we have to believe in things we don't see that's just life really okay what about the Holy Spirit? What about it? Well, he is something we can't see, and you better believe he's real. Look, open up your Bibles to Acts 8. Should we read it? Let's go! right? Cool. That's incredible. I mean, you have Philip, right? A man who loves Jesus being told by the Holy Spirit to go south on a road. Then he sees another man from Ethiopia who was reading the book of Isaiah. Yep. And then the Spirit told Philip to go meet him. But the thing is, the Ethiopian couldn't understand what he was reading. So Philip helped him and got to explain the good news of Jesus. Then after a while, they passed a body of water and the Ethiopian realized there's no reason that he has to wait to get baptized. He wanted to make the decision to follow Jesus right then and right there. Right. So they walked down to the water and Philip baptized the Ethiopian. Then out of nowhere, Philip was taken by the Holy Spirit to a completely different place. I know. This is incredible. I guess I was wrong. Oh, you mean about the whole believing only what you can see thing? Yeah. I mean, I didn't realize how powerful the Holy Spirit is. Of course. Jesus promised us that he would send the Holy Spirit when he went up to heaven. The Holy Spirit makes us strong and helps us. Help us how? <laughs> With everything. Like when you're upset, the Holy Spirit will comfort you. When we need wisdom, the Holy Spirit will give it to us. And when we need help understanding God better, the Holy Spirit is right there to help. <laughs> That's really good news, because I have a lot of questions about my faith and about God. So the Holy Spirit will help me? Absolutely, Carl. The Holy Spirit helps us to want to know God. Great. <laughs> Wait, that's our big idea. Today's big idea is the Holy Spirit helps us to want to know God. So let's say it out loud on the count of three. One, two... Three! The Holy the Spirit Holy helps Spirit us want to know God! To to know yeah. God. <laughs> Good job, everyone. Hey, TJ, I really like that story. Man, me too, man. It's one of my favorites. I can see why. But you know, TJ, I'm still not sure on this whole electricity thing. Really? Why? I don't know. It just seems, like, kind of suspicious. Whoa. What, what happened? Well, I didn't believe in electricity, so I just stopped paying the electric bill to see what would happen. Turns out it gets really dark. Oh, okay, yeah, that that makes sense. <laughs> hey kids, y'all have a good week. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching and tune in next week for a new episode of Grow TV. Now that we've watched Grow TV, we want to share something else with you. Last weekend, 18 people from our church were in a Zoom conference. It featured people from churches all over Canada. One of the speakers was a man named Brian Sanders. He was encouraging churches to use this time of COVID. It's a good time to ask questions. It's a good time to think about what we do. It's a good time to think about what we could do. Maybe God wants to do some new things in his church. So in the coming weeks, people from our church are going to share. They're going to tell you some of the things they heard. And they're going to tell you some of the things that seemed meaningful. This weekend, we're going to hear from Alicia Krogsgaard. Alicia, share with us. So, who's tired of talking about COVID-19? Well, you know, COVID has done lots of things to us and with us. And some negative things, isolation, disconnection, all of those things. But, you know, it's also allowed us to do some really positive things as well. And every aspect of life, people are reevaluating um, 
what they do and how they do it. And it's also a, a good time to evaluate our existence as Christ's church. And as we look forward to our future as God's people in Glen Elm, Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, we need to go back to God's word and rediscover what's God's purpose for the church. Who are we? What is God's intent for us? What are the traits of his people? That as churches of Christ, I, we seem to not have strayed so far from God's purpose for his church, perhaps as some of our evangelical brothers and sisters. But we too have allowed ourselves to become a little bit more institutionalized than what it seems that God intended. Brian encouraged us to narrow down to the minimal traits that make us the church. We can become so encumbered with our programs, our structure, our budgets, our buildings, and even our staff that we fail to remember the basics of who we are. Number one, we are people who proclaim, celebrate, and worship God. The Lordship of Jesus must be paramount in who we are, proclaiming whose we are in everything that we do. Number two, we are people who build community. We are people who walk with each other. We do life together in this fallen world. We love, we accept. We strengthen and sometimes we rebuke. We love as Jesus loved others. Number three, we are a people with a mission. The mission of extending the borders of God's kingdom should be the driving force of all we do as a community of believers who proclaim the Lordship of Jesus. But I wonder sometimes if maybe we've gotten lost in mission, wondering, are we missional people? But then I think, but we are. We are missional people. We have families and groups doing things in various corners of Regina. We have the university students working with university students. We have youth working in Glen Elm and within our church. We have people working with immigrants. We have people working with troubled youth and nurturing children and mentoring people, new Christians, um, Christians to grow. Brian reminded us that God has placed passion in every believer. We just simply need to be led to sit long enough to allow God to show us, each one of us individually, what is my passion? What is it that stirs my heart? Perhaps it stirs my heart to see children who are not placed in loving homes to be placed in loving homes, foster children and foster families. Perhaps you have a real desire to walk alongside young moms. You, you see how difficult it is to, um, to raise children in this fallen world and you want to journey with them. Or perhaps you have a special affinity for people who are facing the dragons of addiction in one way or another. Perhaps you have a real soft spot in your heart for um, teens who are in turbulent years, or maybe the injustices of our marginalized people, maybe of our poor people, maybe of our people who can't find a job because they don't have skills, or maybe you have a passion for nurturing young Christians, or maybe you have a passion for teaching the lost and the dying of this world. What is your passion? And do you know where they lie? Have you raised up a tribe of like-minded people to intentionally bring the kingdom of God to those objects of your passion? The church needs to help prepare and equip God's people to step out into their missions. Many of our community are already doing that, working in their mission, working in their passion. 
let's celebrate that and invite others to come alongside us and do the same as we seek Christ and share Christ, both as community and in our little corners of the world. So I thank Brian for helping to remember that we are missional people. We are called to be missional people. And I'm looking forward to mission being a little more of our focus. No, a lot more of our focus as we worship Jesus and as we continue to build community. I love you, Glen M. We are missing being together one day. All right, it's time to worship together. Before we start, let's read something from Psalm 107. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love. Let them give thanks for the wonderful things he does for people. He gives those who are thirsty all the water they want. He gives those who are hungry all the good food they can eat. These verses tell us that God likes to satisfy us. Dad's going to talk about that more later. But for now, that idea can help us worship. We're going to have two songs from Shane and Shane. The first one will be really familiar. The second one will also be familiar to some of you, but then they blend it into one of their own songs that you might not know. But it doesn't matter if you know all the words or not. Let's use these words as our prayers to God. Let's tell him how we want him and how we love him. Here's our music for the morning. Yeah. 
desire and I long to worship you. Oh, I long to worship
church zoom call at 11 30. it's a chance every sunday to visit together number two sunday night features a special zoom call this coming week bernard krogsgard will be starting chemotherapy and we want to pray for him and his family this will be happening sunday at 7 p.m and all the details were in last week's email number three we have a special offering on may 30th this is one of our missions offerings for this year in the coming weeks, we're gonna talk about the caring place and the work that Travis and Alicia do in Brandon. Start thinking about what you might give at the end of the month. Number four, if you'd like to be a part of this week's offering, there are three ways to do it. The details are on your screen. And remember, if you want to give to Clearview Camp, that you have the rest of the month to give directly to them. Those donations will all be matched. Thanks to all who gave through the church in the past month. It'll be exciting to see some new things happen at camp. Did we cover everything? I think we're done. Okay, Dad, come give our lesson for the morning. Thanks for hosting our morning, girls, and thank you for being here as part of our service today. I'm sure there's a really fun sermon series that could be generated entirely by Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy, or maybe there's not. We best go with some truly valuable words. And so let's continue with our series titled, This is the Way. This is a walk through the Beatitudes, sayings of Jesus. And we've taken that phrase, this is the way, from the Star Wars series, The Mandalorian. That series features this group of warriors who live by a very strict code. And whenever they make key moves or decisions, they confirm to one another that this is the way. That's their way of saying, this is in line with who we are with who we wish to be, with the values we wish to hold. And so in Matthew 5, we have Jesus teaching a crowd of his disciples, along with some curious seekers, and he's laying out for them the way. This is what it looks like to be me. This is what it looks like to walk with me. And so Matthew 5 opens with this group of one-line statements that we call the Beatitudes, and we're into week four. Let's review the ones we've already done. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And what's today? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. In this line, Jesus speaks a blessing over the ones who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does that word righteousness mean? Within scripture, this is a substantial word, and there are at least three things that it can mean. As we read our New Testament, especially when we read the writings of Paul, righteousness is this state of rightness where I or we relate to God properly. Paul's emphasis is often that a righteousness attained by law and by works has been laid to rest, and that in Christ we are made righteous through faith, by grace that Jesus makes us right with God in ways that we could never achieve. So that's one meaning of righteousness. But a second one is about the things we do. It is about righteous acts. It is about right living. We want to live lives that reflect the reality that we have been reconciled to God, that he is doing healing and redeeming work in us, that our broken ways are being mended, that our rebellious paths are being straightened. We want our lives to reflect the values and ways of God. 
And so, of course, Jesus is speaking to people who desire that. We desire to be made right with God. We desire to live before God. We desire to move with God in proper rhythms and steps. But then the third one is even bigger. Within the Old Testament, righteousness and justice are often two words linked together. The Old Testament was in the Hebrew language, and within Hebrew, you needed two words to get these concepts together. The New Testament is in Greek, and in Greek, they have a word that lumps them both together. And so here's why this matters. When I read about righteousness in the New Testament, I know that it's about me and others having proper standing with God. I know that it's about me and others living lives that reflect his ways. But I also know that it's about a concern for the whole of creation. God doesn't just want one person or two people coming back. He wants all of his creation in all of its layers, in all of its ways, coming to him and being redeemed and being healed and being made to be all that he intended to be. And so now we're in a discussion that's much larger than individual people. We're in a discussion that's about systems, that's about societies, that's about structures, that's about all the ways in which we are interconnected to one another. And so when Jesus tells us that walking in his way with him will involve hungering and thirsting after righteousness, he's telling us that it will involve desires to see oppression opposed, to see justice exercised, to see integrity in the realms of business, to see honor in the realms of family, to, to see healing in the realms of relationships in every way possible to see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. On our own, those desires may not burn very hot within our hearts. We have thoughts about ourselves. Our worlds can be quite small, but Jesus is telling us that he has a heart for all of these things. He hungers and thirsts for righteousness in the biggest sense. And so as we walk with him, that heart will get into our hearts and we also will hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is the way. One of the beautiful things about the fourth beatitude is that it involves a special type of kindness. Do you notice who's blessed? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The phrasing speaks of a desire. It's not even something we've necessarily achieved. Jesus isn't withholding blessing and saying, when you get to a certain place, then there's blessing to be had. He's saying, I know you're actually going to have desires that you're not living up to. I know that you're going to long for things that do not yet exist. And there's blessing in that, in the feelings of lack, in the hunger, in the thirsting, in the desires for things that haven't been realized yet. There's blessing on that road. Look at a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 with me. This is a place where Paul is speaking about the judgment at the end of time, and he says, don't judge anything before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in the dark. He will show the real reasons why people do what they do. And at that time, each person will receive their praise from God. It's a basic Christian belief that at the end, God as the judge will set all things right and all will be weighed and things will be properly measured once and for all. But look at the last phrase in that verse, that each person will receive their praise from God. Portrayals of the final judgment often generate fear as if we believe that God is out for the worst rather than the best. But I find it noteworthy that Paul didn't highlight that everyone will get the condemnation that they deserve. His emphasis is everyone will get the commendation that they deserve, that the Father longs to commend his children. He loves to see desires in us, even the ones we're failing to live up to, even the ones that we haven't yet the strength to execute properly on. He looks at us and sees our hearts, and he loves when he sees in our hearts hunger and thirst for righteousness. We want to be close to him. We want to live well for him. We want to be involved with him in the healing of his world. Those things represent a road to blessing. And those are the things that he works in us to create hunger for, that we would be people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So we've lingered with the word righteousness. Let's linger with the beginning of the verse now. Blessed are those who hunger and and thirst for righteousness. In 1986, a movie came out called The Three Amigos. It featured three of the great comedians of the day as actors 
who thought that they were being called to a Mexican village to perform their famous skits. Little did they know that the people thought they were real heroes and they were calling them to be their rescuers and protectors. In this particular scene, our three heroes are trekking across the desert and they are getting a taste of what hunger and thirst look like. Take a look. Now, beyond giving us a bit of 1980s nostalgia and a quick chuckle, that scene is helpful because it does remind us, yeah, right, to talk about hunger and thirst is not always the same. Hunger and thirst are part of the human experience. We get hungry and we get thirsty on a recurring basis. And, and over and over and over, we have to determine what we're going to do with those sensations. But a scan of history and our current world confirms we don't all have the same experiences of hunger. Some of us have lived lives with so much provision that we've never plunged into the depths of hunger or thirst because something is always nearby. The fridge always has food. The pantry's always full. And it's just a matter of determining what I feel like in the moment to take away the rumble in my stomach. But Jesus is speaking to a crowd where many of the listeners might be living day to day. They have just enough. There is no pantry. There is no fridge. And if somebody doesn't get a day of work, then they probably don't get a day of food. So the margin between I'm a little peckish and I'm dangerously hungry was a pretty thin line. And so this helps us understand what he's saying. He's not talking about the hungry of a wealthy person who may or, not, who may, or may not feel like something to eat right now. He's talking about a deep desire, a desire we can't get rid of. A desire that comes to the front of our mind over and over and over again. It's a dominating desire for us. We want the righteousness of God. We want to be made right with him. We want to live right before him. We want to partner with him in making our world right. The hunger and the thirst is deep and it's profound. And we need to walk with him to be filled. But we even need to walk with him to be hungry, right? We need him to stir these desires. We need him to put his heart in us. There is blessing along that road. Some of the Greek geeks who study scripture have pointed out that most of the time in Greek, when you said, I am hungry or I am thirsty, you wrote it in a certain way that it meant you had a craving for a piece of something. I'm hungry for a piece of the pizza. I'm thirsty for a cup of the water. I'm hungry for a slice of the bread. So the language had this image that there's a whole big thing, but I'm just hungry for a piece of it. But Jesus strings his words together in an unusual way that it could be taken to mean the whole. And so Jesus is sort of saying, I want you to hunger and thirst for righteousness in a way that a hungry man might say, I'm so hungry. I don't want a slice of the pizza. I want the whole pizza. I want the whole pizza restaurant. I want all the franchises in the chain. I'm so thirsty. I don't want a cup of water. I want the whole pitcher. In fact, if you take me to the lake, I'll plunge my head in and drink the whole thing. 
Jesus is speaking in somewhat humorous images of how intense this desire could be. And he wants to see his people burn with that type of desire. Because in people with that type of desire, the kingdom would be established. It would be on display and it would expand and it would grow. And the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, that could happen. And God wants that to happen. And so blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled, but the rest of the world will be satisfied along the way. And God would love to do that kind of work. Let's turn a bit of a corner together and move toward communion. I want us to read a story from 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm reading this from a children's translation of the Bible. So follow along. The wife of a man from the group of prophets cried out to Elisha, and Elisha is a very powerful prophet in the Old Testament. She said, my husband is dead. You know how much respect he had for the Lord, but he owed money to someone, and now that person is coming to take my two boys away. They will become his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? I don't have anything there at all, she said. All I have is a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, Go around to all your neighbors. Ask them for empty jars. Get as many as you can. And then go inside your house. Shut the door behind you and your sons and pour the oil into all the jars. As each jar is filled, put it over to one side. The woman left him. And then she shut the doors behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she spoke to one of her sons. She said, bring me another jar. But he replied, there aren't any more left. And then the oil stopped flowing. She went out and told the man of God about it. And he said, go sell the oil. Pay what you owe. You and your sons can live on what is left. This amazing story of God's provision. And when you get to the end of the story, what do you think? Don't you think, man, if she knew that was going to happen, I bet she would have rounded up more jars. She might have gone to the next village. She might have spent a week getting ready, gathering up jars. It reminds me of when we bought our first house. Shannon and I bought our first home here in Regina in 2006. And I don't know if you remember, but from 2006 and then the years to follow, our housing market went up very steeply. And a house that we bought in 2006, we sold in 2008 for double the price. And many of us have looked back. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody knew it would happen. But we've looked back thinking, man, if only we had known, we would have lived on noodles for two years and just mortgaged ourselves up to our eyebrows so that we could have sold things off later and rode the wave to wealth, right? If only you knew. But here God is telling us, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The ones who desire the ways of God, the acts of God, to be aligned with God. Those are the ones who find a unique kind of filling, a unique kind of satisfying. The word Jesus uses for filled is a word often used of animals. It was the word you used for that special animal you were saving for the banquet. And so you fed it a little extra every day because you were trying to make it nice and fat. That's the fatted calf. We've heard of him in another story. But in the story we've heard that phrase, it doesn't end well for the calf. In this verse, the word's being used of people, and it means to be fully satisfied. This is the feeling at the end of the big family meals that we will have one day again, when we pat our stomachs and lean back on our chair and say, wow, what a feast. I am stuffed and happy. That was amazing. That's the kind of filling God wishes to do in regards to righteousness. He wishes to make people right with him. He wishes to make people right with one another. He wishes to see his world healed. And he wants us to join him in that. This is the way. Blessed are the ones who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So let's pray together as we come to communion where we will take in our hands the body and the blood of Jesus reminding ourselves that he has gone to every length to do this work and to call us to join him. Let's pray this prayer together. Father, thank you for every kindness. Deepen our hunger for you and satisfy us with nothing less. Lord Jesus, thank you for showing the way and being the way to the Father. And Holy Spirit, touch the desires of our hearts 
that we would love what you love and want what you want with the body and blood of Jesus in our hands and in our mouths. We come closer today. We are yours, Lord. Amen. If you would like to have communion with no rush at all, then press pause or stop and take all the time you like. As this video moves to its end, two song options will pop up on the screen. The first one is one that we have sung in our church many times through the years called Think About His Love. It was written and will be performed by Don Mullen, who has been blessing the body of Christ with his music for several decades. On the other side, you'll have Andrew Peterson's song, Is He Worthy? We've used this song in the past, but it may be that today you wish to focus on the love of God for you and his world, and you wish to invite that type of hunger and thirsting into your heart. Or it may be that Andrew Peterson's questions about the worth of Jesus and the longings expressed to see God heal and touch the world in which we live Maybe that prayer speaks to you more today. If you wish to choose a song of your own, go with that as well. Hope our service has been a blessing to you today. Remember that our Zoom call happens on Sunday morning at 1130. And that's a perfect place to discuss some of the things that have been meaningful to you or to share some of the things that are going on in your lives these days. We will meet online again next week, friends. Bless you and your households and the ones that you love and the ways that you are hungering and thirsting for righteousness this week. Until we meet again, may the love of God the Father and the grace of the Lord Jesus and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Bless you, friends.